Bom dia a todos. É um prazer tê-los aqui no início, na abertura do Congresso da Transformação Digital, CTD 2021, uma realização da FGV AESP, da Escola de Administração da Fundação Getúlio Vargas, é, feita e organizado pelo Centro de Tecnologia de Informação Aplicada, FGV CIA. Eu sou o professor Alberto Albertin, professor Albertin, que sou professor titular da escola e coordeno o centro. Então, é uma sensação enorme poder coordenar esse congresso, nós estamos na quarta edição, é, e, logicamente, ele é o resultado de um esforço coletivo de bastante pessoas, pesquisadores, professores e alunos que fazem com que o CIA consiga realizar um evento desse tipo. Então, na abertura, de novo, sejam super bem-vindos. Infelizmente, ainda estamos no modelo remoto. Será um prazer recebê-los, assim que possível, uma próxima edição presencialmente na escola ou nas outras atividades. Mas é o que podemos, é o que vamos fazer e certamente teremos é, dois dias intensos de bastante conteúdo, bastante conhecimento, tanto geração como disseminação deste conhecimento. É um prazer ter os atores. Antes de continuar, uma mensagem da Fundação. As manifestações expressas por integrantes dos quadros da Fundação de Túlio Vargas e convidados que participam de eventos e transmissões online representam exclusivamente as opiniões de seus autores, não necessariamente a posição institucional da Fundação de Túlio Vargas. E teremos também que todos aqui presentes concordarem em participar deste evento de forma espontânea e com isso autorizam o uso de sua imagem para essa transmissão que ficará disponível posteriormente nos canais oficiais da Fundação de Túlio Vargas. Então, nós estamos fazendo a abertura do Congresso. A primeira atividade será, como anunciado, um debate, um webinar que acontecerá por volta, iniciará por volta de 10h30. Vou aproveitar os 10 minutos para abrir e explicar um pouquinho o Congresso para todos nós que estamos aqui já presentes e como é que isso vai se desenrolar nos próximos é, dois dias com a nossa atividade. Então, é, hoje, esse ano, o Congresso ele tem como foco principal esse uso, essa aplicação de inovação digital para gerar valor para a sociedade e para os negócios, em especial para a sociedade, que nós acreditamos que é um momento bastante é, peculiar, bastante importante da sociedade, então a nossa intenção é, lógico, conversar sobre transformação digital como um todo, mas em especial nessa geração de valor para a sociedade. Que nós vamos dar continuidade... É, explicando um pouquinho, como sempre faço na abertura, sobre o próprio centro, né? como é para nós entendermos o que, que nós somos né? dentro da escola e qual que é a nossa proposta de valor, para poder também entender como é que ele se insere e o que, que nós estamos ofertando e conversando neste congresso. Então, o centro é um centro de estudo e, como centro de estudo, ele reúne professores, alunos, pesquisadores, tanto internos como externos, e nosso é, o objetivo, o objetivo da fundação e da escola ao ter um centro de estudo é, logicamente, gerar e disseminar conhecimento. Como ele é um centro de estudo, ele apoia bastante pesquisas aplicadas. O que significa? De fato, como é que nós vamos gerar um conhecimento que ele vai, com todo o conhecimento gerado, tanto é, acadêmico quanto aplicado, mas especificamente aplicado, como é que ele pode, de fato, gerar valor, gerar um impacto positivo para a sociedade, é, a sociedade que a gente chama de aplicada. Então, não é só resultado teórico, mas é o um resultado que contribui para a prática. Então, como centro, ele está aí, é de tecnologia de informação aplicada, é, ele é, reúne é, nossos esforços, principalmente para todas essas áreas que estão aqui embaixo, em especial transformação digital, desde 2016, nós escolhemos esse como tema principal, que, na verdade, ele congrega todos os outros que tem. O centro, usando um pouco o linguajar que nós gostamos dentro da fundação, ou dentro da IASP em especial, o centro é uma conexão com a prática. Significa que é uma das formas que a escola tem para poder fazer uma conexão com o mercado, seja o mercado tanto em empresas como a sociedade, de uma forma geral. E que ele tem como grande missão gerar valor, gerar um impacto positivo para essa sociedade. Como é que nós nos organizamos para atender essas duas bases? Primeiro, a conexão, são vários motivos, várias formas de fazer conexão. Duas em especial que eu queria chamar a atenção é o Conselho de Executivos. Então, o CIA hoje tem o um prazer, uma grande satisfação de contar com 13 executivos do mercado. Executivos são, de fato, um grande reconhecimento do mercado e grande experiência na área de uso de tecnologia de informação. Eles é, nos auxiliam para fazer a estratégia do centro e verificar qual que, de fato, são os temas de interesse do mercado que vão gerar esse impacto positivo. 
A segunda grande parte dessa conexão são com empresas, né? são os parceiros do CIA, que eles nos ajudam a viabilizar atividades de várias maneiras, é, tanto de fato é, auxiliando para executar alguma coisa que precisa de algum tipo de recurso, até logicamente sendo de fato parceiro na elaboração e na geração de conhecimento e sua disseminação. Esse conhecimento é feito através de projetos, o principal nosso aí nos últimos quatro anos de transformação digital, com todas as suas tecnologias digitais e mais as tecnologias que a gente chama de associadas. E estão fazendo uma série de estudos de casos, nos últimos anos estão é, olhando todos os setores, e logicamente nos tornamos um observatório para entender o que, que está acontecendo com o mercado como um todo. Na parte de educação, como é uma escola, a escola de administração, é, o centro ele tem a coordenação acadêmica explícita de alguns cursos, entre eles, por exemplo, o mestrado profissional em tecnologia, que é um estrito senso, assim mesmo como ele apoia também o mestrado e doutorado ou a própria graduação em administração. E uma série de cursos de educação executiva, principalmente no nível de C-Level, né, de executivos, onde ele também apoia na discussão e na realização de formação, aprimoramento de formação dos executivos da área relacionadas com tecnologia. O impacto também é gerado diretamente nas empresas, onde o centro apoia as empresas para fazer exatamente a discussão, implementação, estratégias, planejamentos da transformação digital de uso e tecnologia de informação como um todo, desenvolvendo, não é uma consultoria, mas é desenvolvimento de conhecimento, que nós chamamos de desenvolvimento tecnológico. E, finalmente, nesse momento, para chamar a atenção, é a disseminação. A disseminação significa que nós geramos bastante conhecimento, tanto nos nossos projetos, nossa interação com o mercado, e esse conhecimento não fica dentro do centro, ele deve ser disseminado. Então, hoje, o Congresso de Transformação Digital, ele tem exatamente este uh, enfoque, disseminar o conhecimento, não só nosso, mas de todos aqueles que gostariam de vir para cá disseminar, por exemplo, com a apresentação dos seus trabalhos. Então, o Congresso, com este enfoque, ele está organizado nesses dois dias, começamos agora de manhã, é, com essa abertura e um debate. E o debate pega exatamente neste assunto, deste tema que nós escolhemos este ano para o CTD, que é como é que nós vamos gerar valor para a sociedade. É, esse debate tem o apoio do consulado americano, daqui a pouco nós vamos convidar para conversar também, e ele vai ser realizado junto com o um convidado, que é o Richard é, Plata. À tarde, nós vamos ter três atividades, uma delas já de forma bastante tradicional no CTD, são os trabalhos acadêmicos e de negócio. Vamos ter uma série de workshops, que são cursos rápidos, bem tipo workshop, bem mesmo prático, sobre assuntos relacionados sobre a transformação digital, sobre como é que isso acontece, como deve acontecer dentro das empresas, da sociedade. E temos experiência digital. A experiência digital é como se fosse uma, um convite para as pessoas que participam do CTV resolver desafios da sociedade e das empresas. Amanhã de manhã se repete essas três áreas também, e amanhã à tarde nós temos as premiações, tanto dos trabalhos que foram apresentados, como da própria experiência digital, que é a relação de uma proposta de solução para um desafio, e a gente julga aqui nesse dia quem participa desse julgamento é o Conselho de Executivo do próprio CIM. Então, de novo, temos o nosso debate, eu vou mediar esse debate com o Richard Pulata. Ele vai nos trazer, ele é CEO da International Society of for Technology and Education. Vamos conversar bastante não só sobre educação, mas aproveitar a experiência dele, não nossa área, mas em toda a parte de uso de tecnologia, mas logicamente também vamos olhar na parte de educação. Trabalhos científicos, eles foram submetidos, escolhidos, então escolhemos aqueles que mais agregam conhecimento para essa nossa discussão desses dois dias, tanto da parte mais acadêmica quanto da parte aplicada. Essa também é um diferencial do próprio CTD, juntar a academia com a parte aplicada ou prática. Os workshops estão lá no site, tem aí uma relação rápida é, dos sete assuntos que nós escolhemos para fazer a apresentação. É, os workshops estão sendo ministrados por professores, pesquisadores e praticantes, né, pessoal executivo de mercado, que vem nos ajudar a discutir esses assuntos e sempre com bastante base, base conceitual, mas bastante, uma discussão bastante aplicada para, de fato, contribuir para o dia a dia das empresas. Experiência digital, então convidamos participantes para resolver é, desafios que o CIA elencou no último ano dessas é, sete a oito áreas. Então, para cada uma delas, olhamos o mercado, olhamos como é que está acontecendo na sociedade 
para cada uma delas, quais são, a gente entende, neste momento, o desafio atual e futuro, e como é que nós podemos oferecer soluções, logicamente, baseado em inovação digital. Então, isso se forma diretamente o que nós chamamos, obviamente, do CTD, do Congresso, como é que nós organizamos ele, de novo, para convidar todo mundo a gerar conhecimento e disseminar. Vou mostrar rapidamente também o que já é bastante tradicional no nosso centro, como é que nós entendemos a transformação digital, como é que ela se relaciona. Isso, logicamente, ele perpassa toda a linha do Congresso, todos os esforços que nós fazemos nos nossos projetos. Então, entendendo que existe uma quantidade tal de tecnologia que está disponível e essa tecnologia ela vai sendo assimilada. Sempre existe uma diferença entre aquela tecnologia que está disponível e aquela que é assimilada, este gap. Este gap ele aumenta e diminui conforme vários fatores. O que nós estamos falando é que está acontecendo, tem acontecido nos últimos anos, uma certa é, motivação, uma certa situação no mercado, na sociedade, que este gap está diminuindo por causa de uma aceleração da assimilação dessas novas tecnologias, dessa inovação digital. Isso nada mais significa que colocar tecnologia nas várias áreas de uma empresa. São modelos teóricos que vão aparecendo, onde eu posso usar tecnologia como infraestrutura ou para fazer as transações, dados... Lula é o presidente de... executivo da Sociedade Internacional para a Tecnologia em Educação e... É, essa utilização dessas tecnologias nos processos das empresas ou da própria sociedade é que, para nós, permite olhar e ver que vai, pode acontecer uma transformação que nada mais é do que fazer alguma coisa nova, diferente e melhor do que se fazia. E aí que está essa grande diferença de transformação digital. Assimilação dessa tecnologia para fazer alguma coisa diferente, transformar uma empresa, uma sociedade. Isso acontece, logicamente, por alguns direcionadores. Esses direcionadores significa que acontece alguma coisa no mercado que vai, de alguma forma, é, suscitar, vai... É, motivar as empresas a diminuir ou aumentar este gap. Infelizmente, ainda estamos num exemplo é, ruim, mas ele é bastante presente e real. É, a pandemia que aconteceu no mercado como um todo fez com que várias empresas assimilassem tecnologia para continuar viabilizando os negócios, independente de ser presencial ou não. O que está acontecendo é, estamos, graças a Deus, saindo da pandemia, de novo, nós vamos repensar esse uso de tecnologia qual é o nível de tecnologia, nós vamos continuar neste nova situação do mercado a partir de agora. A própria empresa tem lá suas características também para poder administrar ou gerenciar este gap. As pessoas, logicamente, são têm mais acesso ou menos acesso, é, mais vontade ou menos vontade de usar tecnologia, mas certamente elas são, são impactadas por tecnologia. E a própria tecnologia, a própria inovação. Isso gera este uso que vai oferecer uma série de possibilidades, desde melhoria de redução de custo até a própria inovação em si, e que isso gera valor. E, logicamente, eu tenho que olhar se isso está sendo feito de uma forma, é, através de uma governança de uma administração. Esse é o mapa geral. O que neste é, CTD, em especial no é, debate agora de manhã, que nós somos bastante interessados na discussão sobre valor. Então, já que eu vou fazer uso de tecnologia para gerar valor, vamos discutir como isso acontece, que tipo de valor e como é que eu garanto que este valor, de fato, contribua, obviamente, significativamente para a sociedade. Então, é assim que estou terminando a abertura, explicando que que tá, como é que nós organizamos o Congresso e o que está por trás da nossa organização, como é que nós fazemos isso, como nós entendemos. Então, vamos agora dá início praticamente 10h32, dá início à primeira grande atividade do nosso congresso. Essa primeira atividade, como já falado, é esse debate, vai ser a Binar, que é uma Digital Innovation do Transform and Generate Value to Society, é, e daí tem um grande prazer de contar com o apoio do consulado americano. O consulado americano tem sido parceiro do CTD em alguns outros é, eventos, o webinar que estão fazendo, sempre com essa ideia de trazer bom conhecimento, agregando bastante conhecimento e disseminando. Este ano, temos o prazer enorme de contar com o Richard Pulata, para ele nos contar um pouco sobre a sua experiência, como ele entende, vê uh, e a, acredita que a melhor forma de gerar valor para a sociedade é a partir do uso de tecnologia, aproveitando a sua experiência, tanto no mercado americano, mas, logicamente, 
o seu conhecimento mundial dessa situação como um todo. Então, obrigado ao consulado, ao Richard por ter vindo, obviamente. Uh, queria convidar o Jerry para uh, nos acompanhar aqui na abertura e também poder falar algumas palavras e também sobre o Richard, que também vai se juntar a nós. Bom dia a todas e todos. Meu nome é Jerry Kaufman, sou agido cultural do Consulado uh, Geral dos Estados Unidos em São Paulo. E, o, o Consulado sente-se honrado em fazer mais esta parceria com a Escola de Administração de Empresas da Fundação Getúlio Vargas, e como seu Centro de Tecnologia de Informação Aplicada. Agradeço ao professor Alberto Albertin pelo convite e pela oportunidade de podermos participar do Congresso uh, de Transformação Digital. Para nós, é, é sempre uma satisfação trabalhar com esta prestigiosa uh, instituição acadêmica que nasceu como com a colaboração da Michigan State University e, e que ostenta em, em seu uh, sagual um busto do presidente John Fitzgerald Kennedy. E eu aproveito o momento para também uh, agradecer esta honra. Ciência, tecnologia e, e inovação são prioridades na agenda do governo dos Estados Unidos. Assim, o, o consulado tem desenvolvido uma série de, de trabalhos em parceria com uh, instituições acadêmicas, uh, órgãos do, do governo, bem como a iniciativa privada. Estas atividades têm focado em várias áreas, e, e transformação digital tem sido uma delas. Em um, um passado recente, realizamos outros programas em parceria com o FGVSA, para o, o quais uh, trouxemos renomados especialistas americanos para compartilhar suas ideias inovadoras e, e conhecimento de ponta com o, o público brasileiro. Para o governo dos Estados Unidos, é, é uh, prioritário que ciência e tecnologia sejam utilizados no fortalecimento uh, de nossos valores compartilhados, como a democracia, a liberdade, os direitos humanos, a estabilidade das instituições, a, a privacidade, o direito de propriedade intelectual e a igualdade de oportunidades. Nosso objetivo é assegurar que a ciência e a tecnologia sejam de fácil compreensão, confiáveis sólidas e, e facilitadoras de inovação. Além do que, devemos considerar seus uh, respectivos impactos na sociedade como um todo e na garantia com que sejam desenvolvidas com responsabilidade. Também aproveitamos para expressar nosso contentamento que este Congresso a objetiva a discutir a aplicação de inovação digital para atender as necessidades sociais, incluindo a, a diversidade, equidade, inclusão e acessibilidade. Esses quatro princípios são prioritários para a administração Biden e nos satisfaz sobre a maneira podermos participar deste evento que também apoia esses objetivos compartilhados. 
O consulado espera poder realizar futuras parceiras como FGV e A e antes de apresentar-lhes o, o doutor uh, Richard Culara, uh, gostaria de agradecer novamente ao professor Albertin e a toda a sua equipe pela, pela contínua colaboração. Para não tomar muito tempo, vou fazer uma rápida apresentação uh, do nosso conferencista. O, o senhor Richard Culata é o presidente exe, uh, executivo da Sociedade Internacional para a Tecnologia em Educação, e STE. Ele possui vasta experiência em política educacional, formação de professores, tecnologia educacional e inovação. É bacharel em ensino de espanhol e mestre em psicologia educacional e tecnologia, ambos pela Universidade Brigham Young, e iniciou sua carreira como professor. Atuou como diretor de inovação para o estado norte-americano de Rhode Island. Como diretor do escritório de tecnologia educacional do Departamento de Educação dos Estados Unidos, o senhor Culara concentrou-se nos esforços para expandir a conectividade para escolas em todo o país e desenvolver o Plano Nacional de Tecnologia da Educação. Antes de sua função no Departamento de Educação, atuou como consultor de política educacional da senadora Patty Murray. É membro de longa data do ISTE e já recebeu o prêmio ISTE Making IT Happen. Agora, passo a palavra a, a, ao professor Albertin. Muito obrigado. Não, obrigado, de novo, mais uma vez, obrigado ao consular, uma parceria super boa, que nem você mesmo falou, já de longa data, né? fazendo bastante coisa junto, então super bom, certamente esperamos fazer. Então, é, é ótimo ter vocês e certamente vocês é, viabilizam, possibilitam que trouxermos é, palestrantes como Richard Pulata, que está aqui hoje conosco, excelente. Né? Então, isso, de fato, viabiliza, agradeço bastante. Para passar, logicamente, para ouvir o Richard, daí, de novo, deixa eu só colocar um pouquinho mais de, pelo menos, a minha visão, de forma bem rápida, sobre esse assunto que nós vamos discutir agora, que eu acho que daí, pelo menos, dá um pouco da, da minha ideia, minha sugestão para a gente conversar, e depois a gente retoma essas coisas, certamente o Richard vai passar. Então, nós entendemos, logicamente, que nós somos uma sociedade em transformação. Como sempre teve, como sustentado, nós temos cada vez mais a certeza de que este processo de transformação ela tem se acentuado. Nós temos bastante mudanças hoje na sociedade global, ou especificamente Brasil, ou americana, tanto faz, mas certamente nós estamos num processo grande, aonde logicamente o nível de incerteza, de mudanças acontecem bastante, e tem bastante coisas que logicamente essa sociedade está descobrindo e vai logicamente construir uh, ao longo do tempo. É, daí, então, a ideia de que, olhando a sociedade com esse olhar de que ela está em transformação, a sociedade de forma ampla, né, as pessoas, organizações, instituições, logicamente elas são os direcionadores, são os drivers para a gente, para entender que eu posso usar a tecnologia para poder de fazer, de fato, frente aos desafios e oportunidades deste ambiente, deste contexto, dessa sociedade em transformação. Então, certamente, a tecnologia oferece benefícios, mas o que interessa mesmo é a capacidade que essa tecnologia pode dar ao ser aplicada para gerar valor. Esse valor está associado, logicamente, a aspectos sociais. Então, estamos falando diretamente como é que nós vamos aproveitar a sociedade civil, como é que a gente pode, de fato, ajudar ela a melhorar ou própria é, pessoas. Sustentabilidade é assunto bastante premente hoje no mundo todo, acabamos de ter a COP26, né? então tem uma série de preocupações mundiais e globais sobre sustentabilidade. E a tecnologia, nesse ambiente de sociedade, certamente também tem contribuições. Ah, e, logicamente, nos negócios, as empresas que fazem parte dessa sociedade. Então, como é que a tecnologia pode não só ajudar uma desses pilares, mas os três pilares de forma integrada? Então, logicamente, isso está a associação com os ODS, com os Objetivos de Movimentos Sociais, ESG, né? 
que é a parte de é, como é que eu vou ajudar na parte social, sustentabilidade e de, logicamente, de ambiente que eu estou fazendo. Então, isto é a nossa proposta da discussão de hoje. Então, excelente é, ter o Richard para nos ajudar nessa conversa. Então, convido ele de novo mais uma vez. Richard, obrigado por ter vindo, por nos ajudar. Então, é, por favor, faça sua apresentação e voltamos a conversar logo mais. A audiência temem, logicamente, está assistindo, bastante motivada para ouvi-lo, é, e ela pode fazer perguntas pelo chat, nós vamos organizando para voltar a conversar todo mundo lá no final. Richard, obrigado. Bom dia para você. Obrigado. Uh, bom dia. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be with you today. I, I'm, I'm so happy to be here. Please forgive me, I will speak in English. Um, I, I am fluent in English and Spanish. My Portuguese just sounds like a terrible mix of English and Spanish. And so, uh, so I will spare you of that today. I do understand uh, uh, Portuguese. So please, uh, as you uh, write in the chat, as you add in the chat, uh, you're welcome to, to, to write in either English or Portuguese and, and I can generally uh, understand, but, but I will speak in English today. Um, I'm glad to be here. I'm grateful for uh, uh, Mr. Kaufman and the team at the State Department that has made this possible. I'm so grateful for uh, FGV for hosting these conversations uh, and for uh, Dr. Albertine for setting up such a, a, a great uh, topic and, and really getting us started in the right direction this morning. I hope I can uh, uh, add some some useful things to uh, the, the um, Uh, goal that he has put out here today for us. So that's that's my uh, my hope. I am going to share um, a screen here. So just give me one second, and I will do that. Um, there we go. All right. Hopefully, uh, sorry. One second. Uh, Zoom is is being mean to me today. There we go. Uh, it, we have it set up. Up. I know it's not quite full screen. I'm having a little technical issue, but hopefully you'll be able to, to see everything that you need to uh, here as, as, I, uh, as I share. Um, also, uh, let me, um, if we can, very quickly, I, I love being able to talk and present in virtual spaces because uh, we're able to do things like have me visit with you, even though I'm uh, far away and have many of you be able to, to visit without having to travel. The disadvantage, though, is that we can't see everybody. We don't have a chance to see who's in the room or, or who's there. So if, if I could, if, if you don't mind, uh, I'd like to ask you to do me a favor, which is could you go into the chat and first of all, make sure it's switched to everyone, not just to the host and the panelists so that you're, you're sharing with everyone. Switch to everyone. And would you please do me a favor and just quickly say hello. Uh, I want to make sure our chat's working. I want to, because we're going to use it in a minute. So just, just say hello and share something uh, if you don't mind, if there's an area that you are uh, particularly um, focused on uh, when it comes to thinking about technology and, uh, and, and improving our society. So if there's an area that you're particularly excited about or particularly concerned about, put that in the chat so that I can be aware of it. So, so please use the chat right now and just do a quick hello. Uh, tell us uh, who you are and if there's a, um, uh, an idea that you can, uh, um, that, that is particularly on your mind this morning, um, I would love, I'd love to hear that. And, and please use the chat. I know it's, it's somebody said Q&A, please use the chat if you can so that I can, that we can see it. Um, that would be, that would be great. Uh, it, that's important because I can't see the Q&A as I'm, as I'm speaking here. Um, so hopefully our translators can help because I see a lot going into Q&A and, and it would be great. Uh, oh, they can't use the chat. Yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, just kidding. Use the Q&A. We'll, we'll make that work. <laughs> um, uh, okay. That's too bad because there is an activity I was going to do that was going to use the chat, but don't worry about it. We will make this, we will make this all work. So great uh, for you all to be here. Thank you for um, uh, sharing a little bit about who you are. Uh, thank you for uh, 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 sharing some of the the Q&A um, talking about uh, education in the role of digital transformation. We will definitely talk about that. Thank you. Many people have talked about education. Uh, cybersecurity. Yep, yep, yep. Thank you very much. Uh, even climate issues, right? Uh, the environmental um, 
ed education related to, to Amazon uh, for us. Thank you so much. Um, okay, these are great. Thank you for adding in these ideas. It just helps me to know uh, what we're talking about and to be able to share some, some hopefully helpful examples uh, with you all today. Um, okay. Um, let me just share. So, so you you know a little bit about who I am. My name is is Richard Collada. I am the uh, a former uh, lead for uh, uh, education innovation, uh, digital uh, learning at the United States Department of Education. I worked for President uh, Barack Obama for his uh, administration to help make that uh, that happen, and also have served in uh, innovation roles in states. Uh, in schools and in companies uh, for over the last several decades. I'm particularly excited to share that I just uh, recently uh, released a, a new book called Digital for Good. And Digital for Good is a, a book focused on helping prepare young people, kids, to be healthy, uh, effective, good humans in our virtual world. And uh, that's a, uh, um, you know, something that we need to be spending a lot more time on. The book is only available in English right now, uh, but, but hopefully we're in, in negotiations to see if we can get it available in, uh, in Portuguese as well soon. Uh, but, but I think that this concept of, of spending much more time thinking about how we prepare our kids to be happy and healthy in digital spaces is really important. And I'll talk a little bit more uh, about that. Um, Okay, um, we have been through a very, uh, a very interesting time in the last 18 months or so, right? We had this path that we were on, we were moving along, things were kind of going well or not, but they were at least familiar. And then all of a sudden COVID happens, right? And it just kind of blew up our world, uh, all around the world, everywhere, right? Uh, uh, in every country that I work with, every place that I, I speak, there we talk about this disruption, this chaos that we've experienced. And so uh, that's that's been our, uh, our, our life over the last little bit. I, I um, have four children uh, and, and uh, my wife really likes to help make sure our house is, is orderly uh, and clean. This was our house before COVID started. And then we had four young children all in school from our home doing online learning. We don't have a very big house. And so after you know just a, a few months of online learning, this is pretty much what our house uh, looked like. And, and I think many of you also have experienced the, the uh, frustration and the disruption that, that COVID has, has caused. But I do have some good news that I want to share. And this is really important. That is, I have spent years, I spent years studying how innovation happens and where and when innovation occurs. And one of the things that I can tell you is that there is a trend, a trend that happens over and over again throughout uh, history. And that is that after moments of disruption, of crisis, there is a bloom in innovation. Right, and so we have a, a, a huge uh, increase and in acceleration of innovation on the backside of a crisis or a disruption. And so the good news is that we are entering into uh, one of the most innovative times that probably most of us will experience in our whole lifetime, right? Because we are about to move into this innovation phase that happens always after a major disruption and crisis. And, and we've already seen that a bit. So I ask this question, I visit schools and governments uh, and heads of companies around the world. And as I talk to them, sometimes I ask them this question. I, I say, who was responsible for the digital transformation of your organization? You know, was it your, was it your, your chief technology officer? Was it your chief financial officer? Nope, it was COVID-19, right? <laughs> this, there are uh, technical advances that have been pushed along through our organizations, through our schools, through our societies that, uh, that never could have happened if COVID hadn't forced us to do it. And so maybe COVID isn't the way we would have wanted to um, have innovation occur, but it is already accelerating the innovation that we're seeing. And that's exciting. And so, so if we were to finish my goofy little drawing there, uh, it might look something like this, right? We might see that we really have uh, uh, a moment of chaos, but then after the moment of chaos, uh, it looks very different. We see 
um, a, a situation that is, uh, you know, different than the one that we began where, where we were before COVID. Uh, it doesn't go back to the way it was, but it certainly um, is improved and better and, and we can uh, um, experience the benefits of that, uh, that change. One of the things we need to realize is that COVID has fundamentally changed our relationship with technology. This was happening, this was happening before COVID, but COVID accelerated it. How many of you, um, and, and again, sorry, we don't have the chat working, but how many of you, uh, you can just answer in your mind and I'll, I'll try to listen, uh, have uh, been to a, 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 a Zoom wedding, right? A Zoom wedding or a Zoom birthday party. Uh, you know, that's something that none of us could have uh, dreamed of happening before COVID. And now we've all probably gone to several of those. Or uh, in how many cases have, have your children uh, read stories with uh, their grandparents or, or, or have you read stories to your grandchildren or, or uh, vice versa, right? Um, this is uh, an exciting time to think about how technology can make our world uh, much smaller. And so, uh, so it's a time that we can rethink some things. Now, here's a question that I, um, I, was, I was, again, I was planning on asking in the chat, but I just want you to think about this. And that is this, it's important that we think about the silver linings that we experience because of COVID, right? So even through all the disruption, even through all the, 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 the pain and the chaos and the frustration and the dirty houses <laughs> from all of our kids being home too long, uh, there are silver linings. There are um, unexpected uh, benefits. And I think it's very important that we think about what those unexpected benefits are in order for us to be able to um, recognize and, and see opportunities to innovate. Uh, and so that's um, uh, a great question that I encourage you to ask. Uh, with yourself, with your teams, because part of this shift into be, moving from chaos to innovation is recognizing what the unexpected, the unanticipated opportunities were uh, from this time of chaos. And so this is the moment where we are right now. We're right in this transition. And, and what I'd like to share today is uh, some design principles, some ideas that are uh, specifically related to helping us make this transition between the chaos and the, uh, the innovation. And in particular, how technology can help. Now, I will give some examples of education, but I'm also gonna talk to uh, some examples that are, that are um, uh, apply more broadly, just beyond, uh, beyond education. And I, and I hope it will trigger some ideas and some thoughts for you that will be helpful in, in your work. And we'll have a chance to talk more about, uh, about this uh, later as well when we have our, our conversation uh, with, with Dr. Albertine. So first, some design principles to keep in mind. The first one, and, and I put this in here, we could spend the whole hour talking just about this one. Um, I will just mention it quickly, but, but I do need to mention it in here, which is that infrastructure is connected to equity. It is not possible to have people brought into a digital world if we don't have basic connectivity, if we don't have access to the digital world. And again, COVID, like it or not, COVID has done a great job of accelerating access to connectivity. Uh, but we know everywhere in every part of the world, uh, this is still um, a, uh, an area where we need to work more. I have been advocating and I advocate for us to start to treat um, internet connectivity the same way we think about electricity or water. These are basic utilities that are required to have a healthy functioning society today. It's not optional, right? This isn't like, uh, you know, satellite TV service that, that you know, be, it's great if somebody wants to have, uh, but, but this is, this is a, a, a functioning uh, requirement to be part of a digital society and to have everybody participating. And so we really do need to prioritize infrastructure. When I worked for President Obama, um, one of the things that he said, he, he, and this was, you know, um, eight, eight years ago, right? At 10 years ago at this point, it wasn't that long ago. And, and many people assumed that in the United States at the time, we had uh, great connectivity in all of our schools, right? And the, and the the truth was only about 10% of our schools had internet connectivity. Yeah, eight years ago, right? This was not, again, not that long ago. 
And, uh, and one of the things that he said, he came in and he said, um, it is crazy that I can walk into any coffee shop because in our, in the coffee shop, uh, in, in many parts of the world, certainly in the U.S., they have free free Wi-Fi that you can get while you're waiting for your your for, for your coffee. He said, "Why can I walk into any coffee shop and get free Wi-Fi, and yet when I walk into our kids' schools, we don't have access to Wi-Fi uh, internet?" And so that became one of the responsibilities that I worked on, which was to help uh, improve connectivity in our in our schools. And that was a, a critical step in bringing equity to education was making sure we have connectivity uh, in, in schools and in, in libraries and other parts of our society. So again, we could spend a lot more time talking about this, but I just wanna make sure that we don't move on to anything else before we say, before we mention how important um, infrastructure is and making sure people have access and connectivity. So here are some design principles to think about. One that I want you to think about is the power of crowdsourcing the power of using uh, technology to harness the abilities of uh, large groups of people that are very hard to engage and interact with um, uh, for, let me say it this way, that, that are um, much better at solving very complex problems that are too hard for any one uh, individual to solve uh, alone. And, and some of these are, uh, th th there's, some, there's lots of interesting examples of how, how we can do this. I'm just going to share two uh, to, ma to make the point. One of them is, uh, uh, comes from, uh, from, from science and from, from, from the, the field of creating uh, medication and, uh, and new medicines and solving disease. And so this is a game that I'm showing you here. It looks like a highly scientific um, uh, maybe a display, but it's actually, it's, it's a game. And the game was designed to help crowdsource the uh, different ways that a protein molecule can fold. Um, and, and forgive me in advance to our interpreters here, because there's going to be some, uh, some technical language and do your best. <laughs> I appreciate you. Um, when we are looking at create, at, at solving uh, uh, diseases, cancer, viruses, uh, creating medication. One of the things that's very important to understand is how protein molecules work because they determine so much of what happens in our bodies. And protein molecules fold, they bend, they twist in very different ways. And the ways that they bend and twist determine how they act and what they do. And it also turns out that it's very hard to calculate all the different ways that a protein molecule can bend and fold by a computer. But humans, it turns out, are actually really good at recognizing that. And so in this game, uh, the, the, uh, the, the researchers that created this game basically were creating a, they randomly uh, generate different uh, folding folds of, of protein molecules. And then the players, the game players can go in and they can identify, they can try to move it and shape it and form it in different ways based on the elements. And then if they can figure out a new way uh, to have, um, uh, sorry, one second. I have a um, uh, noise that's happening from a um, Alexa device there. Okay, there we go, excuse me. So, um, so in this, uh, in this fold, in the way that they folded here, they, there are points that are given to each uh, individual that receive, that can find a new way to fold the molecule. Does that make sense? And so then hundreds of thousands of people have played this game and have actually discovered far more ways that protein molecules can fold than traditional research had done beforehand. And so this is an example of using technology to crowdsource tough problems. There's other ways to do it too. Here's just one other example. Uh, many people are very interested in finding their ancestors, where, where they lived, where they died, uh, where they're buried. But uh, gravestones, it turns out, are not searchable, <laughs> right? They're not digital, they are stone. And so the only way that people can find out, can do a search to find where their ancestors are, uh, are buried is if people can help digitize them. And so there've been these great crowdsourcing efforts where people that live near cemeteries have been asked to go and just take a picture and then write in on their phone, the name and the information that is on the gravestone. And so now all throughout the world, you can search 
for where your uh, uh, relatives are buried and find them and see a picture of their, uh, their gravestone because people are willing to crowdsource that problem. This approach can be applied to many, many of the challenges that we, that we face today and is a great uh, design element that we should be considering. The third element that I wanna share with you, and I have seven of these, by the way, in all, I wanna share the third one is, it's important that we think about using data as a way to personalize learning. Um, I'm gonna use an education example for this one. Uh, one of the things that's very interesting to me is that when we, uh, in traditional education, we have a teacher that stands in front of the room and teaches for an hour, for, for a whole day, uh, and they teach the same thing to every student. But that's a really interesting uh, uh, challenge because we know that all students don't need the same thing. <laughs> all students are different. They have different strengths. They have different um, uh, uh, challenges. And so we, we teach them the same thing and that, that just doesn't make a whole lot of sense. I often compare it to, to medicine. Could you imagine if you went into the doctor's office and, uh, and you walked in and the doctor without even asking you what your symptoms were, handed you some pills. And you said, well, don't you want to check and, and, and see, you know, what's wrong with me? Do you want to like listen to my heart or, or, you know, check my temperature? And the doctor said, no, no, I give this medication to everybody that comes in on Monday. And no matter what their symptoms are, this is the medication they're going to get. And, and on Tuesday, I'll give another set of medication to all of the patients that come in because that's what's in the schedule. Right. That's a crazy idea. Of course, we would never do that in medicine, but it is what we do all the time in education. We, we prescribe, uh, um, you know, uh, uh, teaching without understanding the needs of the students first. Technology can be really powerful at helping to, uh, to change that. This is a school that I visited in, uh, in New York. Uh, and this school, when, when you come in, let me just show a different picture here. When you come in, the kids see their names on the screens and it assigns them to a different station, a different uh, place in this, this big uh, school. And then based on uh, where they go, they might be in a small group learning um, uh, with other peers, like you see right here in front. On the back left, you can see there's another group that's learning with a, uh, a teacher. Uh, there's a couple kids that are working on their own back a little bit further. And then through the two bookshelves there, you can see a group that's working on a project. They're all working on different things based on what they need. And at the end of the class period, they take a little quiz uh, ask them some questions. It doesn't change their final grade. It just ask them some questions. And then based on that, it and, and looking at their, their homework and other things that they've done, the next day, it informs again where they should be working and what they should be doing. So every experience they have is tailored to their individual needs. That's the power of data. It's much more efficient. It's much more equitable. Uh, and so we can think about uh, really transforming a whole variety of um of experiences in, in our society by using data to personalize. All right, number four, visualizing data changes behavior. This is a really powerful concept that we don't use nearly enough. Some of you have uh, these, these uh, devices or watches that monitor your health and they show, they give you a little screen that shows your, uh, your behavior. Now, this is kind of funny. If, think about this for a second. You need a device that tells you what you've been doing all day, right? You've been with yourself all day. I know that I haven't stood up from this chair. I know that I haven't had any exercise. Why then is it so powerful when I have this app that shows it to me? Well, psychologically, having data visualized to us, seeing our progress in a visual form is a very powerful way to lead to behavior change. And so when we can think about using data uh, about our, our health, about our learning progress, if we're, if we're in, uh, in, in school, uh, about, about our healthcare decisions, uh, about any variety of, of, of topic that matters to us, if we can leverage um, visualization of data, it leads to faster behavior change. And so we should be doing much more of this. Any technologies that we're using to help improve our societies should be related, should, should use data to help us see and then uh, improve our, our behavior changes. Here's one that has actually worked really well. Cars, new cars, have started visualizing how efficient we are driving. 
right? They have this, this little uh, zone where we are more efficient drivers. And if you are driving, you know, not accelerating quite so fast and not slamming on the brakes quite so much, but driving a little more um, efficiently, we actually save a whole lot of energy. Huge amounts of energy has been saved simply by visualizing the data of how we are choosing to drive our car. And that's very powerful. And so the more we can think about ways to visualize data, uh, the more, the more uh, impactful technology can be in helping us change our behaviors. Now, let me tell you a quick story, just one quick story about this from when I was in Rhode Island. Um, in Rhode Island, and, and this map, I know it doesn't mean anything to you right now, but let me explain. Uh, in Rhode Island, we felt very strongly that every student needed to learn the basic understanding of computer science of coding. And, and that's not because we wanted them all to grow up and to be coders, right? We, we didn't, uh, you know, it, we, we, we recognized that even students that wanted to go into music and arts and science and language and business all still needed a basic understanding of computer code. And the reason for that is that coding is the language of future problem solving, right? If you think of any tough problem that we have as a society, somewhere in the solution involves code, it involves knowing how to code. And so it's critical that we have the skill and many schools still are not teaching uh, basic computational thinking, right? We, we, uh, we teach lots of uh, uh, content uh, that may, may or may not be as relevant as, as we need it to be, but, but, compu but computer science is often not taught. So we wanted to go get this to happen. We made a goal to have computer science taught in every school in the state of Rhode Island. Uh, the challenge was if we went through traditional approaches to do it, right, get a law passed, uh, require that people do it, design a curriculum, it would have taken years. And we just didn't have that time. We wanted to do it in less than a year. So we created a map. We went to a map and we plotted, these are all the schools. And when we started the map, most of them were red. Some of those pins were yellow and a few were green. And uh, the green ones were schools that were already offering computer science. The yellow ones were the ones that were about to start and the red ones weren't doing anything. And so we went and had a series of town halls of meetings with parents around the state. And we said, hey, it's really important that your kid learns to code. Uh, computer science really matters. Here's why it helps them get a good job. Even if they don't wanna go into a technical career, it's important for problem solving. And so, and we had these activities and we said, and we have this great site that you can go to and it will show you what your school is teaching when it comes to computer science. And they would look up on the site and this map and they would see some of the schools were teaching computer science and they thought that's great. Most of this, the parents went there and they saw a little red uh, dot. And when they clicked on the red dot, we had the name of the principal and their phone number and their email so that the parents could call and ask why they weren't teaching computer science in their school. And guess what? In six months, we had almost every school teaching computer science in the entire state. This idea of visualizing data is a very powerful way to get behavior change to happen. Now, I wanna build on this concept a bit. And not only do we visualize data, and, and again, that's very powerful and it's a concept that we should be thinking about, but there's another element of data that we can use that, that is, is also very powerful and it's called nudging. Um, and I'm not sure the best translation for this, again, so apologies to my uh, interpreters, but the idea of nudging is a gentle push, right? So gentle push. Uh, nudging is a really great concept, right? Sometimes we, we just need um, a, a push forward. If you, if you ever watch elephants, I love this picture, because elephants constantly do this with their little elephants. The, uh, the, 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 you know, the mother elephant just, just nudges them along, just pushes them forward um, a little bit. Well, data and technology can be used to nudge as well. And let me give you two examples of nudging. When we nudge, we show data, we visualize data, just like I've been talking about, but we add to it a comparison of other people's behaviors. So on the left side here, this is an electric bill. An electric bill, just like one that you've seen, it has an electric bill, it shows how much power you've used and it gives the amount of money that you owe, right? But what they've added here in this one is a comparison to the people around you and how much power they're using compared to you and how much power is being used by other people in your uh, region. And what's very fascinating is when you look at this one, so you can see, and I know it's a little blurry, it's hard to see, 
The first one, this first uh, green bar are your, your neighbors around you. So how much power they're using. Then the second one are, is the average of your, uh, of the people living in your, uh, in your, in your neighborhood. And then the third one, the blue bar is you. And what happens is when you see this, you go, oh, because, because we always, right. We always get a, a, an electric bill and it shows us how much power we've used. And we're like, I don't know, two kilowatts, 37 megawatts. Th we, it means nothing to us. Like we don't know what those numbers mean. But when I see this, I go, oh my gosh, I'm using significantly more electricity than my neighbors. Maybe I should turn off some lights, right? Maybe I should turn the heat down a little bit. This is one of the most powerful ways and we've seen huge reduction in energy use just by being able to show my consumption uh, as compared to somebody else. And that is the idea of nudging. On the right side, let me give you one more example of this. This is an example of some schools that we worked with that have done it with attendance. So again, a parent gets a, a note that says, you know, a letter or a note or a message or a text that says, your kid has been absent this many days of the school year. And we go, okay, cool. I don't really care because whatever, right? <laughs> but when you see this is how many days your kid has been absent, that's the bar up top that's in red. And this is how many days the rest of the class on average has been absent. You go, whoa, I have a problem here. And so all of a sudden parents who didn't seem to care about attendance were getting their kids to school on time. And we know from research that one of the most important factors for student learning is just being there, just getting to school. Uh, and so this idea of nudging is a very, very powerful technology that we should be using much more of as we think about uh, designing the future of learning, designing the future of our, our society, and how and where we, we can encourage people to make better choices using technology. Okay, um, just a couple more here. We need to spend time prioritizing user experience. It is great, right? Look, at the very beginning, I talked about the, the importance of having um, uh, infrastructure, having devices. Uh, it's important that we, we do that, no question. But <laughs> we also have to make sure that the user experience of the technology that we're putting in front of citizens uh, is, is of high quality, that it works. Uh, I see this all the time in education. I see this all the time in uh, in healthcare. We don't prioritize effective user experience. And so, so here's the experience, just, just to make the point here. I like to, to use images to make the point. So when I use my, my phone, right, uh, I, I have an experience that kind of looks like this. You know, just touch here and, and it will work. When I go use uh, Google, I have a very uh, streamlined experience. Just search here, right? When I go to uh, participate in online learning, <laughs> when I go to use to find out how my kid is doing in school, when I go to sign up for healthcare, this is the experience that I get, right? Weird error messages and things that don't load and, and a user experience that is just terrible. We have become uh, accustomed to allowing technology that is being used for social purposes, for, for societal good, to have really terrible user experiences, user interfaces. And that's just not acceptable anymore. We have to make sure that signing up for healthcare, that getting medical attention, that getting uh, access to our kids' uh, grades, that uh, for our children who are, are participating in, in online learning, for adults that are participating in online learning, that the experience feels much more like this or this and not this. And that's an area that we just must prioritize. There are so many times that I am in working with schools or universities. And the teachers are saying, you know, oh, this, you know, it's so hard to teach. This technology is, is really, is really uh, uh, not working well for us. And the response that I hear is, oh, these teachers, they're just not good at, at tech, right? We got to get them more training and because they're, they're just, they're old and they don't know how to use technology well. That is not the case. What we have to fix is the user experience of the technology we're putting in front of them. Teachers, even, even uh, uh, some of our most senior uh, teachers or, you know, and, and leaders, when, when they're put in front of technology that looks like this and this, they're great. When they're put in front of stuff that looks like this, it's, it's a very different experience. And so it's very important that we prioritize uh, user experience. And I'm going to give you a, a tip uh, for how, how to do that well. There's an idea called user shadowing. 
This is a great, uh, great idea that you may want to think about as you're thinking about the role of using technology in the future. Now, user shadowing basically means it's super simple. It means you follow the users through an experience, whether it's physical or digital, and you don't try to push them or mentor them or tell them what to do. You just watch their experience and you learn from it and you use it to improve the the uh, the tool set that you that you're using. Let me. Um, let me give you a fun example of this. When I worked, when I was the chief innovation officer for the state of Rhode Island, one of the things that we were really concerned about is the, the, the transportation system. Navigating our transportation system was not easy. There wasn't a good app to use. Uh, there wasn't a good um, uh, uh, tool for buying um, uh, tickets, uh, there, for planning when and where our buses were coming. It, it was very difficult. And most of the people that designed that system had never actually taken public transportation. They drove their cars to work, right? And so one of the activities that we did is we said, uh, we want you to come. Uh, we, we actually brought them all, all of the leaders of our, of our, uh, of our government uh, came in and we had a meeting. And we said, uh, we want you to, uh, to talk about this problem, but we're gonna do it on the other side of town. And in order to get there, you have to take public transportation. We purposely put the meeting right next to the bus, the central bus hub. And then we had all these senior government leaders that were out trying to figure out how to buy a bus ticket. And it was hard to do and they couldn't understand. We had like homeless people coming up and trying to help these senior government leaders because they knew they could figure out better than, than, uh, than they could how to, how to buy a ticket. And what we did is we hid photographers. We hid people with cameras in the park, in this central square, and they took picture, pictures of them trying to buy their tickets and use public transportation. Um, you can see on the left, they're, they're, they're getting some help on trying to figure out how to do it. On the right, this is our chief technology officer. This is our head of technology for the state, was so proud that he finally bought a ticket. And then he turned and got on the wrong bus and went to the other side of town. And so this, by the way, when they finally got there, we had all the pictures up so they could see, uh, you know, their experience trying to buy, buy tickets. They experienced firsthand how unusable, uh, how difficult this system was that we had put in front of our citizens. So using this idea of user shadowing is a very powerful tool to improve the design of learning, uh, of, 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 of using any, um, any uh, system. Now, you can also do this in schools. As you know, I, I do a lot in education. We have a great project that I've been part of called Shadow a Student. It's part of a work that I do with Stanford University. Uh, and, uh, and, and it's a challenge that we do, we do every year. And we ask, student, we ask uh, uh, leaders, education leaders, teachers, uh, uh, head teachers, principals, to take a day and shadow a student, follow a student through their day and through their experience not to try to teach them, not to try to mentor them, just to observe school from the viewpoint of a student. And then the day after we do a reflection and we say, what did you learn? It is fascinating what they learn. They say, in 10 years of being a school leader, I never knew how uh, little time our students get one-on-one -on -one with a teacher, or I never realized how much time students been waiting online, or I never realized how difficult it was to log in to our online learning tool, or I never realized how dirty the cafeteria is or, or whatever, all these things, right? It is so powerful. And many, many educators, many teachers, many leaders say the most learning I've ever done in my career has happened in this one day when I had to shadow a, a student through their, uh, their learning experience. Okay, let me wrap with two final thoughts. The first is, there's a lot that I've thrown out here, and I realize that. I'm very aware that I've just thrown a whole bunch uh, uh, your way. But I want to be clear that we don't have to tackle everything at once. And in fact, we shouldn't tackle everything at once. There is a great uh, tip that I will give you, which is this idea of designing in iterations. Uh, sometimes this is called an MVP or a minimally viable product, right? So when we're designing a new tool or a new approach, the goal is not to do as much as we possibly can, but the goal is to do as little as we possibly can and have a tool that works well. And then over time, add more features and more functionality to the tool. 
traditional, and, and I love this design here because this, this picture shows the two different approaches. Traditional design, whether you're talking about technology, whether you're talking about building schools, whether you're talking about building government processes, traditional design works like this. The first year, you design the wheel. The second year, you design the, the, the other wheel. The third year, you design the body of the car. And finally, in the fourth year, you have a working car. And so in all this time, these three years, nobody gets any value out of the car because it's under development. And usually, now, now this picture is a little bit wrong because in, in uh, number four there, it shows a working car. But when in reality, the car is never working, right? In, in four, it has you know square wheels or windows that are, are dark, so you can't see out of them. And, and so you have you know four years of development, but you've never had any humans actually using the tool that you're building. And so it usually doesn't work very well. Now, this other approach, the iterative design approach, which I have below, and, and of course, many of you are, are very familiar with this, says from day one, from the very beginning, we provide something that is useful to the users. It might be a skateboard, it might not go very fast, but it's gonna be better than walking, right? And then we're gonna add the ability to steer, right? And then we're gonna add gears so you can go faster. And then we're gonna add a motor. And then finally, we're gonna add a car. But from day one, we're providing value. When I was the chief innovation officer in Rhode Island, we made a rule that we wouldn't do any project in government that didn't provide value to the citizens in less, it, 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 unless it provided value to the citizens in less than six months. Now that's crazy because most government projects takes years and years to develop, right? And so we were designing and we said, we have to be able to provide value immediately because you learn every step along the way from the users, how they, they like to interact with the tool that you're building and it forms and shapes the way you think about uh, the, the final product. And it's really great to watch. So I've gotten, I'm, I'm kind of geeky, I'm kind of a nerd. And so I, I watch for minimal viable products for, for iterative design everywhere. And there's some great examples. This was a school I was visiting uh, in, in Guatemala and they were trying to have a ping pong tournament and they didn't have a uh, uh, the right equipment. And so they decided that they would make a minimally viable, uh, you know, an, an iterative um, ping pong table by using what they had. Uh, here's another one, you know, somebody, I was watching somebody who was trying to make, uh, make a cake and their, and their recipe book kept getting all the ingredients on it and it was hard to, hard to see. And so they used what they had. They took the tools that they had available and they made a way to uh, um, uh, look at their recipe uh, without getting uh, ingredients on, uh, on the paper. And then here's my favorite one. You know, when you're, when you're uh, watching a, a video on your phone after a while, you're holding it up, your, your arms get tired. And so I love this kid who was very thoughtful about coming up with a, a minimally viable uh, solution for, uh, for his phone uh, to be able to watch uh, what he wanted to watch without having to tire his arms. These look funny. They look, uh, you know, simple. But this idea of using technology in simple ways to quickly get um, uh, user experience happening, to quickly get people using the tools, informs the design of our products down the road. And I think that is uh, really, um, uh, really critical as we think about designing new and future solutions. Here's my final thought, and then I'm going to end. I said at the beginning that after uh, moments of disruption, we see a bloom in innovation we see an acceleration of innovation happen. And that's true, it's absolutely true. But we also have to be very careful. And that's this, technology, and I wanna be clear about this, and this was something that I, that I, I made very clear uh, uh, in, in my book. I have a whole section in, in, in my book that, that talks about this concept. And I wanna, I wanna end making sure that, that this is a, um, a, a very clear concept in everybody's mind. So uh, technology, is uh, uh, like a, a curved mirror. Uh, have you ever seen one of these curved mirrors, right? You, you can put your, your, your hand or whatever in front of it. And, and what does it do? It makes it bigger. It expands it, right? It, 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 uh, it heightens it, it accelerates it. Technology is like this curved mirror. It does not have a conscience. It does not have a moral compass. It does not care whether what we apply it to is for good or for evil. It doesn't care if it accelerates good behavior and helps improve society or helps tear society apart. 
And we are in a world right now where we are pointing technology at things and not being very thoughtful about the downstream in, uh, impact of it. We're pointing technology uh, at uh, forums where debate is happening, but there is no healthy uh, guidelines for how to have effective debates. We are pointing technology at learning experiences for kids that are not high quality learning experiences. And when we point technology at those things, it will absolutely accelerate them, make them more available, uh, just like this big mirror. It will accelerate the bad just as much as it will accelerate the good. And so we have to be very thoughtful as leaders in, in our society that we are pointing technology at the things that we want to use to improve our society, that we are pointing it at good uh, practices in education, that we're pointing at good, helpful tools to improve uh, healthcare and, and civic engagement, uh, and that we're being very cautious and very thoughtful about uh, uh, putting in guidelines and norms and rules and regulations that are helping keep and prevent us from pointing this mirror at um, uh, tools that do not uh, serve the common good, that don't accelerate good and healthy behavior online. I believe that we are in this really, this really exciting moment. We are right here in this, in this space between chaos and innovation and, 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 and the use of technology. We are now a digital world and that is not gonna change. We will stay being a highly digital world even after COVID continues to go away. What we have to decide is how that technology will be used. Will we use it to solve some of the tough problems that we experience as a society? Or will we be comfortable allowing it to just revert back to some of the uh, dysfunctions that we've seen during this, this, this chaotic moment? If we are able to leverage technology in smart ways using some of these design elements that I've talked about, I believe that we, might, we may look back at COVID many years in the future and say, you know, that thing that we experienced, that very disruptive moment, it may be the best thing that happened to education. It may be the best thing that happened to government. It may be the best thing that happened to our civil society because we leveraged that moment of chaos to rethink and redesign to make a more equitable, more effective, more civil world in this digital space than the one that we had in the physical space before. But that's up to us. And it's up to our prioritizing uh, those, those skills uh, and, and, and those uh, uh, design elements as we think about how we're using technology in the future. Thank you so much. Thank you for giving me some time to spend with you today. Uh, we're excited to be able to continue this conversation and I'm, I'm very excited to hear your questions and also uh, some of the other uh, participants that will be uh, joining in, in the program a, a little bit later. It's, uh, it's such a great pleasure to, uh, to be able to spend this time with you today. Michelle, muito bom. Obrigado pela tua apresentação, excelente. Super ideias, gostei do set top que você faz. Que curioso de ver os outros slides, né? Que eu vi que você tinha mais lá, mas certamente em algum momento vamos ter oportunidade depois de vê-los, né? Mas super interessante. Ah, eu, nesse, é, você, ó, pela sua experiência, aí também tem muito sentido, porque nós somos dentro de uma escola, né? Falando, fazendo webinars no Congresso dentro de uma escola, então, muito sentido os exemplos que você deu, que fazem muito sentido para a gente também. Só que, certamente, essas mesmas, os princípios que você está contando servem para qualquer setor, né? Então, eu fiquei imaginando uh, como ficaria uh, alguém responsável por varejo, ou para a área de saúde, ou financeiro, etc., fazendo essa mesma dica que você deu, né? acompanhando e sendo shadow uh, de alguém que é seu cliente, que é seu paciente e tudo mais, é a mesma relação. Uh, ao mesmo tempo, também, como é que poderia ser isso para garantir de que, uh, até perceber que a tecnologia, achei super interessante, como é que a tecnologia ela realça os dois lados? Né? Interessante isso que você falou porque, ao mesmo tempo, ela realça aquilo que era bom, aquilo que também não era tão bom assim, né? Então, assim, ela evidencia uma série de coisas que a gente precisa repensar como faziam antes, né? se juntar essas duas ideias, é bastante interessante em qualquer dos setores. Super bom. Ah, eu queria assim, te ouvir um pouco, porque, seja para a escola ou qualquer outro setor, ah, tem duas coisas que eu queria te ouvir. Primeiro é de que ela requer 
que quem for fazer tecnologia ou usar tecnologia, ela tenha outras preocupações que ela não tinha até então. Vamos ver se eu consigo uh, traduzir um pouco qual que era a minha ideia da pergunta que eu queria te ouvir. Assim, eu como professor, né? então como professor estou uh, ministrando a minha aula uh, e de repente uh, a pandemia me fez ir para o digital, já ia na área de tecnologia, então era mais fácil, mas foi, não importa. Uh, e daí se eu começar a pensar agora nas dicas o que vem para frente, significa que uh, eu vou olhar a experiência que o meu aluno está tendo, aquilo que eu possa fazer melhor, mesmo seja MVP, é, de que, mas, de qualquer jeito, ele vai requerer de mim mais tempo para fazer coisas que talvez antes de 2019 ou no momento só é presencial, eu não teria que gastar esse tempo, tá certo? Reinventar as coisas que eu fazia, a forma. Então, eu imagino que aquela escola que você é, nos mostrou, né? Certamente, para chegar naquele nível de o aluno olhar todo dia e ser redirecionado os vários grupos que podem acontecer, isso demanda tempo de preparação e tempo o tempo todo de preparação do que vai acontecer. Né? Então, queria que você contasse um pouco a tua experiência é, dessa mudança, né? que, de repente, a relação é, com o professor ou com o executivo, ou com o funcionário, com o colaborador, ela muda, porque agora é outro tipo de responsabilidade, né? Um, yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Great. These are great points. First of all, but before uh, talking about uh, answering the question, I, I just want to comment. You made this this point about how these principles can apply across a variety of sectors, and I hope I hope that was clear. They These are design principles that apply whether we're talking about government, uh, healthcare, retail, uh, uh, you know, online uh, uh, marketing efforts. Right? They 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 cut across, and that's it's so important to be thinking about that. You know, this idea of, of, of understanding users and their experience with whatever service we're providing is so critical and something that especially uh, in, in, in uh, you know, public sector spaces, but even in private sector spaces, we don't spend enough time on. So yes, these are, these are consistent principles that can apply everywhere. Now, you brought up this point that some of these things that I showed, uh, like the, uh, the school, you know, that was a major effort. It was a major redesign. And we do have to be willing to redesign things. And we do have to be willing to, to not um, hold so tightly to what we've always done in, in the past. But, but the good news, and I want to share this, but, and, and this is why I, I shared that idea of, uh, um, um, of iterative design, because some people can get overwhelmed, right? They think, well, we don't, we don't know the connectivity. We don't, you know, our students don't understand how to do this. We're, we're Uh, I don't have the time, I don't have the energy. What's important to know is that the best solutions, the best digital solutions happen in small steps, one at a time. And, and so if you say, look, yes, I don't have time to build this whole personalized school, but you know, what's a small, what's a small step? Well, one of those might be, and, and I love this idea that I, that I have worked with, with uh, schools to do. In many um, schools, uh, universities, at the end of the class, we ask students, Uh, what they thought about the class, right? But we ask them that question after uh, after the class is over, when they're already gone. What what value does that serve? It serves no value to ask students who are already gone what they thought about the class. And so one of the small things that I, that I, I do when I work with universities is say, take your end of class evaluations and put them right in the middle of the class. And so now you get student feedback and now you have the rest of the semester to adapt and change what you're doing to meet those student needs. That's one quick example. Here's another one. Uh, you can, uh, at the end of every class, send a text message to, your, uh, to the class and ask for, uh, a, have a quick, a quick question that, you, that they should know the answer to and have them respond what they think their answer should be. There's also some software that can help do this too, a little quiz, quiz software. And you can immediately see if there's a gap between what you think the students should know and what they actually know, right? Those are simple things to do. They don't have to, re you don't have to redesign the school, you don't have to redesign, but they give you data that can help you begin to personalize. So little small things that you build on and slowly building and adding new approaches before you know it, you have transformed the, the experience, but it happens in these very small bites. And again, that's the same in government. It's the same in, uh, in, in industry, small iterative changes uh, to help you get more input on how the user is experiencing your service, experiencing your service that leads to the bigger things and it's not so overwhelming.
de super bom. É, tem algumas perguntas que eu vou é, encaminhar é, também, encaixando uma outra, ou pelo menos associando uma outra ideia. Né? É, partindo da discussão sobre educação, a gente tem estudado isso também razoavelmente bem, é, logicamente eu posso associar tecnologia com a educação pensando simplesmente eu vou ensinar tecnologia. Isso é um nível. Né? Podemos olhar é, a associação com tecnologia, usar a tecnologia como um meio para ensinar. O Zoom é um meio para ensinar. O que nós estamos falando, e você tocou bastante bem nisso, é como é que nós usamos a educação para formar o cidadão para uma sociedade digital. Como é que a gente insere? Como é que ele vai obter algum tipo de autoria digital, de participação nisso? E, logicamente, não só para a educação, mas como um todo. Como que nós estamos falando, e daí eu estou pegando a sua palavra de propósito, né? Então, o propósito de uma escola tem que mudar, assim como o propósito de varejo e, e todos os setores. Isso requer uma mudança muito grande. E daí até veio da audiência também, né? É, o cutucão, o nudging, né? Que você estava falando. É, o pessoal perguntou assim, bom, mas como é que a gente cutuca? Né? Como é que a gente é, faz as pessoas saírem desta zona de conforto para, de fato, começar a fazer esta mudança, que é uma mudança profunda. Tem a nível de empresa ou da instituição, a nível de pessoa, mas vai a nível de cada um dos nossos indivíduos. Né? Então, o pessoal está pedindo para você comentar um pouco mais sobre é, esse nudging, sabe? Como, é que eu, como é que eu faço as pessoas saírem da sua zona de conforto? Yeah, uh, great questions. So a uh, couple thoughts here. First of all, let's talk about the, um, the element about preparing, teaching young people to be effective members of a digital society. That's a really important question. And I, and I did mention, right, I don't think we're doing a very good job of this in schools today. Um, we, stop, we talk a lot of, uh, about a lot of topics. Um, we even talk a bit about uh, being safe online. There's a little bit of online safety, especially for uh, younger, in younger grades. Uh, there's some conversation about, there's very little talk about how to be an effective member of a digital world. Now, schools are quite good at teaching how to be effective members of the physical world, right? From kindergarten, from the very youngest grades, we learn to share, right? When a kid wants a, a toy and they rip it out of the other kid's hand, uh, you know, the, the teacher says, wait, wait, let's come together and talk about a better way to share when you want something. That's not how we do it, right? When you get older in school, we practice debating, right? We practice having a discussion where two people disagree and they talk about how to respectfully present different viewpoints. We do that at the university, right? We do all of these things. Oh, here's another one. When we are uh, out in a public space and we see trash on the ground, right? Parents, most of us as parents, pick it up and throw it away. We, we are showing our kids that even though it wasn't our trash, we're going to clean up the space around us, right? That's how we teach uh, being good you know, humans in physical spaces. We are doing a terrible job. <laughs> Sorry. We're doing a terrible job of teaching how to be good digital human, humans in a digital world. And we need to do a much better job of it because one of the things that we know about how the brain works is concepts that you learn in one uh, domain, in one, in one environment, are very hard to transfer to another environment. So when we learn how to be good humans, when we learn how to be good people, how to hold the door for somebody coming uh, by, how to uh, help somebody get off the bus if, if they're elderly, when we learn all that in the physical space, it doesn't transfer to the digital world. We have to actually teach those things there. And so it's critical that in our schools, in our universities, we're talking about how do you be a kind person in a virtual space? What does kindness look like? What does a post that is kind, kind look like in a, in, a, in a virtual space? What does using technology to make your community better look like? Advocating for good ideas, uh, encouraging people to make better decisions in virtual spaces, all of those things. Uh, those are the types of, uh, of, of skills that we have to overtly teach if we want to have young people grow up to be able to lead in a, in a, a, a world where most of their interactions with, with other, other people will happen in, in virtual spaces. So thank you. I know that was a little bit of a, a, a little speech there, but, but it is very important to me that we are thinking about how are we infusing these digital skills into our, uh, our teaching. Now on the second topic that, that you, you mentioned here uh, on this idea of, of nudging people, um, it, it is important that we're very thoughtful about what we're nudging them to do, 
right? That is, you know, we, we've said this, uh, Dr. Albertine, we've said that these tools can be used for good and for evil. And there's lots of nudging that we see happening on social platforms that are nudging people to evil. They're nudging them towards content, towards videos, towards groups that are asking them to, uh, to, to think uh, in, in mean ways, to be angry people. And we need to be leveraging that same technology to help nudge them to making better decisions. Uh, and, and, and so, and it all comes down to data, right? What data can we share with them and again, we're, we're not manipulating people here. We're just showing them data about their choices as compared to other people's choices. So great example about, you know, how to, how to reduce water by showing how much water you use compared to somebody else. Another one, um, you know, might be, uh, um, uh, you know, around, um, well, school, certainly. We talked about uh, attendance in there. Um, voting, that's, that's another good one. So uh, people who participate, in, who vote, uh, showing, just showing them on a piece of paper, um, here's, how many, here's the, 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 the number of people around you that have voted every election. Here's how many times you've voted, right? That's a nudge to get them to vote. You can do this, by the way, in uh, commercial settings as well. And in, in, in um, uh, uh, you know, commercial markets, you can say, here's um, some some things that we're, we're noticing a pattern of some things that you're buying. Let me share with you what other people have have bought too, if they are in your you know that that have similar interests. And so we can nudge them towards hopefully higher quality, uh, better purchase decisions that they will that they will like better. Acho que sim. Aí é uma uma questão bastante complexa, né? Porque exatamente na hora que você vai mostrar, você tem escolhas do que você vai mostrar, né? Então, esse é o grande problema hoje, né? De, da, das plataformas e tudo. É, tá bom, eu posso mostrar, mas eu vou mostrar tal padrão ou tal outro padrão. E daí, logicamente, que você está falando, é importante essa comparação e nessa comparação você vai se autodefinindo. O problema é se o padrão mostrado né, tá aí algum tipo de questionamento. E daí não leva outra questão de que assim, o ideal seria se a gente tivesse de novo voltar na minha, é, pelo menos na minha, que eu de fato acredito, que é a complexidade de a gente formar cidadãos, e não precisa ser só criança, nós mesmos adultos também temos que nos é, reensinar a nós mesmos, né? como viver num ambiente digital, porque é uma outra realidade. Isso me leva a uma outra questão, né? É uma questão de que talvez não seja mais, e aí vai estourando cada vez mais complexo, e por isso que eu acho que a sociedade vai aumentar a sua complexidade. É, até na, eu gostei do seu desenho, né? de que vinha uma linha, ela vira toda confusa, depois a gente tenta arrumar ela. É, na parte anterior da linha, a gente tinha, ou tinha uma percepção de que a gente estava no mundo físico, você deu vários exemplos, né? Daí eu dominava um determinado mundo físico, porque faz muitas décadas que me ensinam como ser tá, no mundo físico. A gente aprendeu a ser assim. E, de repente, o novelo, por conta da pandemia, infelizmente, ele deu uma virada e nos jogou todo mundo no digital, uma parte, vamos dizer assim, de muito rápida, onde a gente não tem esse tempo de habilidade. E estamos discutindo que agora eu vou ter que ter um tempo para aprender a habilidade do digital. Só que provavelmente, e daí é uma discussão também interessante, de que eu vou estar não no físico ou não no digital, eu vou estar no famoso híbrido, né? de que isso também se fala bastante, como é que as escolas vão viver o híbrido. né? Então, no fundo, é, como é que eu, estando presencial, eu ganho todo o valor de tec tecnologia no meu presencial, mas eu posso migrar para o digital rapidamente, instantaneamente, sem perder aquilo que eu estava de rico no presencial. Como é que eu junto? Né? Então, essa é uma complexidade, porque eu vou ter que saber ser gentil no físico uh, e ser gentil no digital, sem esquecer nenhum nem outro. Né? Uh, vou querer saber como é que eu junto tudo isso, comparar meus modelos. Então, eu queria te ouvir um pouco na tua visão sobre essa parte mais híbrida né? que deve acontecer, essa convenção. Pode ser escola ou pode ser qualquer outro setor, porque, de fato, eles se assemelham muitas vezes. Uh, it's, it's a great point, right? The, these, we, uh, we are forever now in a blended world, right? Uh, a hybrid world, but a mixed. It's, 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 we, we've blurred the lines. It's like taking an eraser and we've sort of blurred the lines between digital and, and physical. 
I do think it's important for all the reasons you said that we specifically call out and we specifically teach skills of being good humans in digital spaces. And, and that's critical because as I said, those the skills of being a good digital human don't just automatically carry over. But that doesn't mean that the, that the, the moments that we switch between physical and digital spaces aren't happening constantly and getting and getting blurrier, right? So uh, so so yes. And and the cool part, here's the cool part is there are things that technology does really well, right? It allows for for collaboration, for access to expertise. The idea that we should, uh, you know, that, that somebody shouldn't have access to expertise because they live uh, in a remote location is, is one that our children, young people growing up with, will never understand. They'll never understand that. And, and that's awesome, right? Uh, so, so there's all these great things that, that technology brings. There are also times where technology is not as helpful, right? There are moments when it is really um, powerful to just sit down and eat together with somebody, have coffee with somebody and have it have a meaningful conversation. There are times where we need to experience things together to collaborate in ways that is hard to do uh, virtually. And so, so the best, you know, the goal that we have here is really that we can pick and choose the best of both worlds. Um, what worries me a little, we have to be careful, is that sometimes I see people, uh, we, we pick the worst of both worlds, right? So we, I go to a, a, you know, a, a university and I see a teacher standing in front of the room and talking for an hour with no interaction. Uh, well, that should be done in a virtual space if you're going to use this. And then I go and I see a, a, you know, a virtual world and they're trying to you know, have some, some deep interaction and it's a little bit clunky and it's hard to do. Well, just flip those, right? Let's use our time when we're together to really be more intimate, to have engaged conversations. And then let's use times like this to, to present uh, uh, content. So, so knowing how to pick the best uh, activity for, for each activity, for each um, uh, uh, mode, right? Digital or physical, I think um, re really matters. You also brought up another point, uh, uh, Dr. Albertine, which I think is really important. And that is um, how complex our digital world has become. And you said, you know, I was talking about we need to teach young people how to thrive in a virtual world. And you said, yeah, some of us older people with some gray hair, we also need some uh, experience here. You are completely right. Um, and, and what's interesting to think about is our our virtual world, you know, when it started, when, when you and I first got on the internet, when we first sent an email, it was a very simple digital world, right? We, you know, it did a couple things. It was, it was just, it was pretty simple. It is now very complex, and and the um, the norms and the expectations of how to act and how to interact, how to um, keep your information um, safe, how to create safe spaces for others. We, we talk a lot about how to keep ourselves safe. We don't talk nearly enough about how to create safe spaces for others, how to find information, how to know what is true versus false information. These are complex skills. And, and we just need to be spending far more time uh, teaching, uh, teaching these, uh, these skills. There, there's a class, actually, let me just share one quick example. There's a class at the University of Washington uh, here in the United States where uh, two professors got together and they said, we're teaching all these things. We don't have a single class on how to recognize true and false information in virtual spaces. And so they created a class. Uh, um, it has a, 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 a little bit of a, an inappropriate name. Um, it's, they called it recognizing bullshit. And so uh, you can feel free to uh, <laughs> not repeat that. But it, the class filled up instantly, 500 students in two minutes when it was open. And all they did was they went through and they said, how do we recognize when information has been manipulated, when, when we're getting information that's not helpful? It, these are skills that we're just not teaching. And they're so important for us to be successful in any aspect of the, of the digital world. Coming up with these norms, coming up with these um, you know, standards, as you said, we have to talk much, much more about what those norms are gonna be. É interessante, de novo, é, e daí vou pegar a sua ideia, né? Daquilo que a gente fazia antes e agora, como é que a gente vai reaprender. É, e aí atravessaram o chat, né? Como aprender a ser civilizado de um lado de outro, assim por diante. Então vou dar, pegar esse seu último exemplo. É, a gente já tinha fake news há muito tempo. E provavelmente no mundo físico talvez fosse mais fácil, porque eu consegui identificar da onde 
se tem mesmo aquela loja, se é isso, eu vou lá e checo e tudo mais. De repente, eu estou num outro mundo, que é completamente diferente, eu tenho que, de fato, como você está falando, reaprender. Né? E é um é que eu jogo isso, super bom. Eu queria, é, assim, primeiro eu estou ficando com o Doc, já está começando a ir para o final do nosso tempo. Né? Então, é, super boa a conversa, Richard, mas eu queria aproveitar esses últimos minutos para você também comentar um pouco e voltar no tema que a gente é, combinou do webinar, né? A gente vai gerar valor para a sociedade. Então, assim, então, que isso é uma, nós falamos sobre valor o tempo todo. Né? Então, eu queria que a gente começasse a, a arrumar um pouco essa conversa, nesse final dela, para, assim, é, fazer uma lista muito bobo, não tem sentido, mas, assim, é, como é que eu poderia, assim, identificar, de fato, qual que é o valor de uso de todo esse ambiente digital para a sociedade como um todo? E, é, inexoravelmente, né? nós não vamos evitar depois discutir para saber se isso deu certo ou não. Já vou falar qualquer coisa. Eu estou deixando a sociedade é, mais, uma coisa bem boba, ágil. Muito bem. É, como é que eu meço essa agilidade para ver se, de fato, está é, chegando lá? Ah, eu vou deixar a, uma sociedade ela mais é, social, que eu tenho interações sociais mais é, adequadas, fluídas, com respeito, civilidade. Como é, como é que eu meço? Então... Essa, são dois componentes que eles são juntos. Né? Que tipo de valor a gente, de fato, vai conseguir ajudar a sociedade? É, e como é, assim, como é que a gente vai perceber se a gente está indo no caminho certo? Né? Então, a gente tem discutido isso muito internamente na escola, muito internamente na, no próprio é, centro, de identificar o que, que, de fato, é valor. Agora nós estamos entrando com ISG, estamos entrando com ODS, com desenvolvimento sustentável. E, assim, tá bom, continua sendo valores que a gente quer, indicadores. Queria te ouvir um pouquinho. Yeah, um, great, great way to end, and and not a not an easy question to give me as we wrap up here. That's a that's a very uh, a difficult one, but an important one. Um, and you know, I think uh, I I think one of the things that is really critical is is um, we we've spent so much time um, being excited about what technology could do uh, that we haven't spent enough time thinking about what it should or should not do. And it's really important that we are considering how we can use technology and data in particularly to help improve our lives. We aren't thinking about it enough that way. What are, how can we use data to make our lives better, to help us be better learners, to help us be uh, better parents, to help us be better members of the society, to help us be healthier, right? Those are the questions that we have to be thinking about. How to use our money better, right? How to make uh, better decisions about planning for our future. Those are all uh, elements that I think we need to be thinking about in terms of how we use technology. Now, uh, as your, your, your question said, how do we know if it works? How do we, how do we measure it? Um, You know, I, I don't have the the right answer, but I, I really do hope we can spend some more time uh, talking about what those metrics are. Uh, certainly, health is one of them. But but let me share one. Maybe maybe I'll end with this topic, this this thought, which is um, I think we need to do a better job of learning how to measure happiness and measure when people are feeling. Uh, happy with their choices, with their lives. There are an, an interesting trend that we're starting to see around the world is some countries are actually creating ministers of happiness. And they are looking at what are some ways that they can do to help in, in a world that is very complex, a world that we can make sure as a, as a society, we're happy. And, uh, and I think that uh, includes healthier debates with one another. You know, you don't, you're not happy if you're, if you're constantly in angry debates and angry act interactions with people. So that's one of them. You can't be happy if you're, if you're not healthy. And so it's, it's funny, but I actually think we need to spend a lot more time thinking about how we can use happiness as a metric and how we can be using data and technology to serve increasing our happiness as a society and our engagement with each other in this shared uh, civil society. So anyway, uh, that's we should have another conversation sometime and we should talk more about those metrics. But I think it is really important that we are asking us those questions. How will we know if we're building the society that we want to? How will we know if we're pointing these devices at things that are making us happier and better people versus things that are maybe making more money for somebody, but not actually helping us build a better society. Deixa eu aproveitar, é, e daí também é, para ir terminando, né? 
Mas, assim, é, junto até com uma conversa que você teve agora há pouco, que me chamou bastante atenção, que também é bastante coincidente que nós temos discutido com o que eu particularmente acredito. Então, você está falando de felicidade, nós estamos falando de experiência, né? Então, assim, tem que ser uma experiência. É, na, aqui na escola, eu brinco muito que eu sempre quero me divertir. Exatamente esse é o conceito, né? Tem que sempre ser uma situação gostosa, prazerosa, que você mesmo que vai aprender, mesmo que vai ser um serviço muito difícil, duro, ele tem que, de alguma forma, me deixar bem. Né? Uh, e daí você mencionou aquela escola super interessante de que a medição dos alunos não é no final. A medição da experiência de um cliente não é no final, depois que ele já saiu da loja. Né? Então, eu imagino que educação, e para fechar de novo, nós somos da área de educação também, né? então, assim, a, a forma com que nós medimos, avaliamos conhecimento hoje, ela também tem que ser questionada. Porque, afinal, nós estamos ampliando o leque do que, que a gente quer formar como cidadão. Lá no passado era conteúdo, vai ensinar matemática, vai ensinar isso, o mestre, se ele aprendeu esse conteúdo. Se eu estou querendo, imaginando um cidadão mais amplo, o que ele vai ter que aprender o leque é maior. Portanto, eu vou ter que ter outras dimensões de avaliar ele é, e também processos diferentes. Né? Não só no final do ano fazer uma prova, acho que aí não vai muito funcionar. E aí, de novo... Esse é um convite para um próximo webinar, né? Como é que a gente imagina um processo de avaliar melhor sobre o valor de fato que se vai dar e como é que a gente mensura isso de uma forma, seja educação ou não. Excelente, Richard. Fiquei bastante, agradeço de novo a tua presença e em especial ao consulado por ter é, nos possibilitado de trazer. Então, super prazer, a apresentação excelente, o debate melhor ainda. É, sempre eu termino com uma frase né, de que assim o assunto não está é, acabado, exaurido, finado, né, mas já está na hora, infelizmente, de acabar. É uma pena, a gente podia ficar. Não sei se você tem alguma mensagem final que você queria, mas eu te agradeço bastante. My final remark is just thank you so much for bringing me here. Thank you for having this great conversation. And, and I'm so uh, uh, glad to hear this many people have been engaged in what I think is a really important topic. And I, I look forward to continuing the conversation uh, at another time. Excelente. Eu vou aproveitar enquanto está terminando, compartilhar só a tela de, que, de avaliação para que a gente possa, de novo, poder é, também pegar, logicamente, a opinião de todo mundo, vou deixar aí para o pessoal ver, enquanto a gente vai terminando. Então, de novo, agradeço bastante, Giste, a, a toda a audiência, nos ajudado a fazer essa boa apresentação. Obrigado, e super apresentação, super contribuição, Richard.